I want to thank each and every one of you for being here. It's very, very important. Um, and uh, uh, we look forward to uh, the next couple of hours in, in uh, uh, the pres Bobby's presentation and, and fielding questions. We have 160 folks virtually online this evening, 160 folks. So that's good. Before we get started, I'd like to ask uh, our commissioner from Hatteras Island, Danny Couch, to lead us in an invocation. Good evening, everyone. Let's just seek to peace for just, just a few moments. Creator God, we are thankful for unity. We're thankful for this beautiful place that we call home. Heavenly Father, with all its wildness and all its wonderfulness, we know, Heavenly Father, that solutions are dealt with reasonable minds and that solutions are made when people come together and find common ground. We thank you for that spirit of cooperation. We thank you for that inspiration. We thank you for each and every person here and the many blessings you've bestowed in their lives. We just ask going forward that you remember our efforts. Remember that when one is served, all are served. Amen. Thank you, Commissioner. May we stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd certainly be remiss if... Um, I didn't express my appreciation and hospitality shown by the Rodanthe Wave Salvo Community Center uh, who took time to set up this room this evening and meeting. And certainly, if you've ever come down here and had a meeting, you're not lacking for food, I can tell you that. And good food, and good food. Um, so I want to thank them, thank them for doing that. Let me get through a couple of housekeeping uh, items. I'd like to remind everyone that the restrooms are in the back of the building, uh, down this hallway. If you go all the way to the end, it's the ladies. You have to take this first left, go to the other side of the building, and that's the uh, men's room. Uh, we're not going to have any planned breaks, so um, you may have to take advantage of that. Um, in addition to those here in person, I think I've already mentioned to you We've got 160 people virtually online. That's fantastic, and we're hoping we'll be able to uh, answer all of their questions this evening as well. Um, we will have this uh, 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 taped, and we'll show it later as well. So, uh, you know, uh, certainly keep that uh, in mind. And once again, just before I get started, I am very, very pleased to have with us this evening um, uh, our county commissioners. Uh, we have our vice chairman, Mr. Wiley Overman, is here this evening. Wiley. Uh, we have uh, Commissioner uh, Rob Ross is here this evening. We have Commissioner Irvin Batenman is here this evening. We have uh, Commissioner Steve House and, of course, Commissioner Danny Couch, who gave us our invocation. I'd be really, really remiss if I didn't mention Commissioner Jim Kitchen. Oh, Jim Kitchen. Jim <laughs> Jim Tobin. Jim Kitchen was my former boss. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> when the heck did that come from? I want you all to really, really keep Jim in your thoughts and prayers. And I will, I will that, that's all I'll say at this point in time. He would be here, but he's got some major medical, and uh, we're praying for him daily. So please keep him in your thoughts and prayers. Um, we have this gentleman here is uh, certainly no stranger to you folks, and that's the uh, park superintendent, Mr. Dave Halleck. He's here this evening. Um, we're going to let him sit tonight and kind of cool his heels. And, but if there's some questions coming down that road, I'm sure he'll be willing to answer some of those. We also have his assistant superintendent here with this evening, Robin Snyder. Robin's back there in the back. Um, don't eat all those cookies back there, Robin. So. Uh, and then he has some uh, um, uh, fellow uh, officers here and uh, staff as well uh, with us this evening. 
we have from uh, Representative uh, uh, Murphy's office, we have uh, Leslie Ginsky. Leslie, thank you for being here. I saw her earlier this morning. We met with our legislators, uh, our state legislators in Currituck this morning, the county manager and I, and, and um, so that was, a, that was a good meeting. Uh, Trey Lewis, is Trey here? Is Trey in the audience? Yes, Trey, thank you. From uh, Senator Tillis's office, Trey's here this evening. Uh, I'm, I apologize for some standing room back there, folks, but um, this is good. This is good. Um, again, I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. And at this time, I'm going to take the uh, opportunity to introduce the county manager, uh, Mr. Bobby Alton, who is also our county attorney. Uh, that we've had for a number of years, at least the 10 years that I've been on the board, and he's, he was around a few years prior to that. He's done an excellent job for Dare County, and we could not be uh, more pleased to have somebody with his caliber uh, to, to, as our county manager. Um, I will say this, uh, he will probably not uh, uh, acknowledge this in his presentation, but We've done beach nourishment projects as well as you all know. And I, I, uh, I, I like to call Bobby the architect of what's happened in uh, Dare County with the, the way we put this plan together with our municipalities. He won't take a whole lot of credit for that, but I can tell you there's people all over the country picking his brain and his brain about how we were able to do this. And uh, at this time, Bobby, I can't thank you enough for what you do. Bobby's going to really set the stage, answer a lot of questions you folks have. So um, at this time, I'll turn it over to Bobby. Thank you, Mr. You, you see up on the board there, you see uh, our web page. And when we finish tonight, if there are questions that you didn't answer or didn't get answered or you think of tomorrow and wish you would have asked, you can go on that website, go down to the bottom and go there and send those questions in. And we'll try those and we'll answer those. Uh, we on our web page we have a frequently questions slide and as we get questions we'll add them to that page and we'll add the answers to that to that page as well that will allow you all um, to keep up uh, as things change as we go forward. All right so to understand where we're going and how all this works you've got to understand sort of how we got to where we are. Um, we've been working on beach nourishment in Dare County since the late 1980s. And you have to remember that in the late 80s, people weren't sold on beach nourishment. In fact, almost no community in beach nourishment. They thought we were throwing money in the ocean and it was a waste of money. And so it was a controversial issue when the discussions began in the late 80s. Um, in the late days, we proposed a project. We proposed a project with the Corps of Engineers. That it was going to be a project. The Corps of Engineers designed the project. Uh, the Corps of Engineers got the project permitted. It was going to be a federal project. At that time, there was federal beach money available. Uh, the feds would pay 70%. The state would pay 20%. And the county had to pay uh, the other 10%. Uh, we created an occupancy tax at that time in Dare County. It's the same one that we have today. Uh, that occupancy tax was designed to create a project. Uh, for more than a decade, we didn't get federal or a Democrat president. It didn't matter if we had a Republican Congress or a Democrat Congress. No one was able to get the appropriation in a federal budget that gave us the 70% federal share. So in the late 1990s, Nags Head and Dare County decided we're just going to do the project without the state or the Fed. Uh, we've got this oxy tax that we created for our 10% share. It's created a pot of money, and we're going to move forward and build a project. Um, so Nags Head was the first municipality to do that. Um, we negotiated a deal. There was no magic in it. It was just a straight negotiation where they paid 50% of the cost and we paid 50% of the cost. 
Again, remember, nobody else wanted to do beach nourishment. Everybody else thought this was a bad idea and that we were throwing money in the ocean. So we did that, and we, we paid 50% of their project, and the town paid 50%, and we began going through that and, and building that project. Uh, that beach nourishment fund, as I told you, comes from the oxy tax. Uh, most many of you have cottages that you rent. You pay that oxy tax. Two cents of that oxy tax goes into a fund that can only be used for beach nourishment. Um, it is a beach nourishment fund. Uh, the occupancy tax generated about $14.6 million in fiscal year 2021 and another $15.7 million in fiscal year 2022. Um, so you would think, well, that thing is growing tremendously with those kind of numbers, and we should certainly have money available. Um, our issue there is we believe those are one-off years. If you go back to 2016 to 2019 before COVID, our growth rate was about 3%. 3% uh, growth in the oxygen or 4% growth was three or $400,000 a year in that 2%. So that's what we budget on. We can't budget on the... 30% growth that we had in the two years. Now, if over time we find that something more than 3 or 4% becomes the growth rate, then we have to adjust our models and adjust our things. But for now, we're not growing at the rate that we grew uh, during COVID. Um, when we began trying to figure out what we were going to do with money, we put some policies in place. And this was the boards back in the night. It wasn't, I don't know if there's no one on the current board that was on the board at the time these policies were put in place. But the idea was to put sand on the beaches when it was needed and where it was needed. So if we had a beach that was deteriorating in a town or somewhere in the county and we had the funds available, we were going to build a beach there. We didn't set money aside for geographical areas that didn't need it. I'll use Avon as an example. In 1990, Avon had several hundred feet of beach, two dunes. No one ever in their wildest dreams thought there would ever be a need for beach nourishment in Avon. So we didn't set money aside for that. We put it where it was needed. Uh, the idea was to keep the beaches looking good. The idea was to make sure that when the Weather Channel or NBC or whoever came down here, they were standing on beaches. If you let one go, then what happens is you can have all beautiful beaches, but they go stand on the one that's eroded and say, look what's going on in Dare County. And, and all of a sudden, you know, you've had an impact on our economy and your businesses and your rental incomes and all those things. So we chose to put sand where it was needed, irregardless of the geographic area over time. Um, we had some financial people meet with us, meet with our engineers, meet with our finance department, and we produced a model where we projected our future costs out into time. We wanted to be sure that if we invested $20 million in a project, that we had money in the future on those five-year intervals that you have to do the maintenance available to do that maintenance. Because if you do not, if you invest your 20, and then in five years you can't go back and do the maintenance for what you lost, then you've wasted your $20 million. And so we set up a model where as our fund grew, we set aside money for each project that we did so that in, over time with the growth in our revenue and, and we've projected our expense costs going up and all those things that are fed into the model, we had money for each project. And we never added a new project until we had sufficient funds, one, to build the project, and two, to do the future nourishment that it was going to take on those five-year intervals. The other thing that we did is we created a policy where we were going to leverage our dollars. So if we needed $20 million to build a project, it was really difficult to come up with $20 million at, on day one and write a check to the contractor. But if we went to the bank and borrowed $20 million over five years, we could generate $5 million a year to repay that short-term debt. That allowed us to leverage our funds and do more projects and do more things. So that's the process that we use. However, because you're using that short-term debt, you have to plan for that. And we have a, a policy that we set aside one year of debt service so that if we had a storm in June that wiped out a season and we didn't get those occupancy tax revenues, we've got enough money 
to pay that year's debt service set aside and ready to go. So the three criteria for a project were we had to have the money to build the project, we had to have the money to do the future maintenance of the project, and we had to have the money to set aside the debt service to cover uh, a bad year if we ever had one during the five-year term before the next project. And so that was the criteria that we used, and very good. Uh, and that's what we, we did from that point on for all subsequent projects. Um, Nags had built their project amid all that skepticism, and it got completed about two days or a day before Hurricane Irene hit. And we thought, oh gosh, what's going to happen? So the morning after Irene, we hopped in a car, dodged the debris on the causeway, and headed to Nags Head and, to see what had happened. And we walked out on the pier and were astonished that the beach was there. It was still there. It was just like it was the day before the hurricane. There was no sand in the road. Uh, there were no houses damaged. There were no hotels damaged. That beach nourishment project had did, did exactly what it was intended to do, and it protect all the infrastructure as well as the homes uh, in that area. It prevented the flooding on the other side of the road. All those things that you build these projects for, it worked. And at that point, the other town says, oh my gosh, we got to do this. Those towns that were skeptical, that were losing their road, losing their houses, having flooding between the highways said, we've got to do something. And so the other towns began looking towards the Beach Nourishment Fund um, to do that. So we didn't have enough money to do that. Um, now you told you Nags had spent, paid 50% of that. Um, they did that by creating what's called um, a special service district in a town. Uh, it's called a municipal service district in a town. It's called a, a special service district in the county. But they created a service district of the area that was benefited by the nourishment project, and they taxed those people their half of the project. Um, if you took that amount of money that they taxed and you spread it out over the whole tax base, not just the oceanfront, but the whole tax base, it Look, it was about 27 cents. If everybody in the town had paid, they would have all paid 27 cents. Nags had chose not to do it that way. They made the people on the oceanfront pay more. No, I'm sorry, that everybody in town would pay seven and a half cents. They chose not to make them pay the seven and a half cents. They chose to consolidate the tax to the oceanfront and a couple back and, and charge those people 27 cents to get the same amount of money. Uh, and so when the other towns came on, they wanted to do a project as well. And so we used that formula that if you taxed everybody in that town seven cents, here's how much money you would generate. And whatever amount of money that was, it was then up to the town to divide it among their residents however they wanted. That meant that people that were benefiting from the project, whether they were in Kitty Hawk or Nags Head or Avon or wherever, were essentially paying the same tax rate for the project. Now, in, in Nag said that 27 cent created like 50% of the project. In Buxton, it created like $200,000 of a $20 million project because the tax bases are so disparate. Um, but the people who benefited paid the same thing and that was the only way that we could think of to make it fair among the people who benefited from the project. And so that's how it's been done. And so everywhere we've done beach nourishment has paid uh, that municipal service tax uh, to have skin in the game and to pay towards the project so that any citizen that gets it in Dare County, you can't say, I got an Avon and I didn't have to pay, but in Nags Head, they have to pay. Nags Head folks and Avon po folks all had to pay. And so, um, so with that said, that's the history, that's how we got to where we are. Um, you know, as we went forward, both Buxton and Avon became areas that needed sand, and they got sand. Um, you know, where we are now is Rodanthe needs sand. However, the fund won't cover today a project in Rodanthe. Um, Rodanthe wasn't done earlier because until the bridge was done, DOT maintained protection of the road there, and by protecting the road, they protected the other oceanfront. And so we put the money in places where DOT 
wouldn't protect and that were endangered. Um, now Rodanthe is not protected by DOT, and so now Rodanthe has a problem that we've got to figure out how to solve. So we don't have a project designed there yet, um, but what I did is just to give us something to talk from, I said, what if we did a project like this? This is something I made up. It has nothing to do with an engineer or anything else. And I just drew a line down at, at Mac Oka Drive and took it all the way to the northern end of Rodanthe, and, and that's about two and a quarter. The same distance as the projects that were done in Buxton and roughly the same distance as the project that was done in Avon. So we were trying to, I was trying to get some kind of an apples comparison so that it would make sense to you all. And so um, the, the engineers, when we did the Buxton, they did a study back in, I think it was 2013, and of course that study's 10 years old now. We believe the erosion rates have increased since that study was done, and so we don't think it's going to be a valid study for us to use, and we've engaged those engineers to do a new study that we don't have the results from yet to tell us what those erosion rates are. Uh, that's important because those erosion rates tell us the quantity of sand that we need to build a beach there. The quantity of sand then tells us we know what it costs today in today's numbers for every cubic yard of sand. And so if we have those volumes, we know what a project in that area was, will cost. Um, just a little primer on what beach nourishment is so that there's no misunderstanding. When you do a beach nourishment project, you build a beach. And, and let's just say you want to have a beach that's 100 feet wide. So you take your existing beach and you build it out till it's 100 feet. Now you have your beach, and that's the beach you're trying to hold. You then calculate your erosion rate, and if your erosion rate is X number of cubic yards a year, you calculate that, and that's how much sand you have to put on top of your 100 feet so that you, that erodes over five years until you get back to 100 feet, and then in your maintenance you put that back. And so you're continuing to put that back, but you always have 100 feet of beach. And so that's when I tell you we're doing a five-year cycle. That's how it works. Um, so the question then becomes, how do you pay for it? Um, the 2013 study said the cost would be roughly $20 million. Um, we know that's not going to be enough. Um, we've got 10 years of price escalation there. We've got an erosion rate that's increased. Uh, we know we're going to need more sand than they projected. So that's probably not enough money, but we don't know yet what enough money is. Um, you know, at the time of tonight, we, we checked our beach nourishment model. We have about $6 million available to us to put into a project somewhere. For us to meet the three criteria that I gave you, to build a project, to uh, have enough money to do the maintenance in the future, and to have one year's worth of fund balance available to cover a bad season, if we only did a, 30 million, a $20 million project, we would need $30 million in new money um, on top of the six that we have. So $30 million of new money is what is preventing nourishment right now from being done anywhere else in the county. Um, and, and that would be the cost. And so the question is, how do we pay for that? How do we get it? That fund isn't going to grow in our lifetimes fast enough to create $30 million. Um, if it's growing at 3 or 4% a year, it's growing at less than half a million dollars a year. If you call it growing at half a million dollars a year, it takes two years to get a million. I need 30. That's 60 years for the fund to grow to get it, assuming you could hold today's cost to do it 60 years from now. So... That fund is not going to fund beach nourishment anywhere in Dare County and, and not in Rodanthe either. Um, you know, the question becomes, could we tax the people in Rodanthe enough to make up that money? So we went through and we ran the tax values of all the properties in Rodanthe. Um, when you look at that, if we created a special service district that, that took every property under Ocean Sound, anywhere in Rodanthe, um, and tax them um, 
at the rate that it was taxed in the towns, the way we did other beach nourishment projects, it would only generate $636,000. Uh, a penny on the tax rate in Rodanthe generates about $23,000. So for every penny we raise taxes, we get $23,000. You, you multiply that by the 27 I talked about, that gets you 636. As you can see, there's no multiple of $23,000 that you all could possibly afford that gets us to $30 million. Um, and so we're not going to tax our way out of this either. Um, and so, therefore, to do a project in Rodanthe or anywhere else in Dare County from this point on is going to require some other source of money. And the only other two sources of money are federal money and state money. Um, so let's talk about that just a second. Um, I'll talk about the federal money first. Um, the, the federal government has not added any and is not adding additional beach nourishment projects at that 70, 30, 20 split that I talked about earlier. Um, there are towns that have, I'll take Wrightsville Beach, they have one of those projects. Uh, their project expired several years ago and they were going to stop funding the Wrightsville Beach project altogether. Uh, their congressman goes in every year and, or every three years or whatever the time is and tries to get an appropriation to keep them on track and he's been successful a couple of times doing that but they're not in the annual project fund anymore and that's been what's happening in lots of places is as those projects expires the, the federal government's trying to eliminate those projects so we're not going to get in a federal project like that um, there's as you know there's a lot of money floating around out there right now there's a, a lot of money that went to the uh, Department of Interior um, I've talked with Dave Halleck about that. He's got some requests in to the Park Service that could help us there as well. Um, the issue there is he's competing for funds for beach nourishment in Rodanthe against funds for every other park in the United States at some level or another. And we really don't know how that prioritization is going to occur at the Department of Interior, but that is an opportunity for funds too. Um, I've talked to many of you, some of you all have connections, maybe connections is not the right word. Uh, you, you know congressmen and people uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, certainly talk to them about it and help us do whatever we can do to try to get funding down from them, whether it's through the Department of Interior or otherwise, and, and that way we may be able to do something there. Um, the other opportunity is with the state of North Carolina. Um, me and others in my position up and down the coast of North Carolina. Um, I sit on the North Carolina Byways and North Carolina Beach Inlet Waterways Association. Uh, I'm the chairman of that association. We've been working with the legislature for a while to try to get them to create a beach nourishment fund, not just for Dare County, but for the whole state. Much as they did an inlet management fund where they created dredge money for all the shallow draft inlets throughout the state, we need a recurring fund at the state level to help us fund nourishment projects in North Carolina. Um, we've talked to them a number of times. Um, our Board of Commissioners, um, we haven't been to Raleigh in the last five or six years that we haven't had a conversation with our legislative delegation in Raleigh about that. And in fact, you heard the chairman say we met this morning, we had a conversation with them this morning uh, about that issue. Um, our delegation is a coastal delegation, they get it. Um, they led us to believe they're in favor of trying to do that. Um, we don't know where that's going to stack up in the priorities of the state, but nonetheless, um, we think we have their support, I think, and so we're working that angle too. And, and similarly, if you know your state legislature's here, then you can help us with that. Um, I'll tell you that it's not just us. Um, the other coastal counties are working that as well in the NC Byways is working that as well. So we're all working whatever angles we can to create dollars so that we can do something to fix problems. Um, so where are we now? This is sort of the short, is the county doesn't have funds to pay for a beach nourishment project. We don't have $30 million to do that. And without an influx of new money, we, we aren't going to be in a position to nourish in Rodanthe. Um, that's the first problem. 
The second problem becomes when and if funding was identified, if we happen to get $30 million tomorrow, the question becomes what is the priority for nourishment in that, with that money? We have three significant problem areas on Hatteras Island. We have the canal zone as you come off of the bridge. We have Rodanthe, where you all are here about tonight. And we have Isabel Inlet between Frisco and Hatteras Village. And all of those places are at risk. Um, and so the question becomes, when you have money, what is your priority? Um, what we would like to have happen is we would like the Department of, of Transportation to take responsibility for the area in the canal zone. And we'd like for the Department of Transportation to take responsibility for the area at Isabel Inlet. So that relieves us of that burden. If that were to occur, then we can focus our efforts on our third spot, and that's the area in Rodanthe. If that does not occur, if, if DOT continues to be reactive, and I'm not bashing DOT, they do tons of good things for us, and we're glad to have partnerships with them, but they have limited resources, and because they do, they are reactive. They don't act until we lose a road. Um, you all that have been here a while knows what happens when we lose the road. We've lost the road in Rodanthe a number of times, and it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare for you all to live here. It's a nightmare for the business community. It's a nightmare for our public services. Uh, it's just a nightmare all the way around. And so if you lose the road at the canal zone, then you've lost access to all of Hatteras Island. And the question becomes, if we're required to have that responsibility, is that a higher priority than doing something on the ocean front in Rodanthe? And I don't know the answer to that question, but that's a decision that would have to be made at the time by those that make that decision. You have a similar problem down at Isabel Inlet. Um, if you lose it again there, then you've lost all of Hatteras Village. And so those are hard decisions, tough decisions that have to be made when and if funding becomes available. Uh, and they become really difficult if DOT doesn't take the responsibility for the roads and leaves it to us like they did in Buxton and like they did in Avon. Um, those projects were done because DOT refused to do anything uh, to solve those problems. And so that's where we are, and, and that's sort of what's out there ahead of us, and those are the problems that we have to overcome um, to get to beach nourishment uh, in Rodanthe. Um, so, I've got a number of questions here. Some of them I may have already answered, but I'll go through this list real quick, uh, and then, then I'll get to you for your questions if I haven't already answered them. Um, one is, what is beach nourishment and how are projects funded in, in Rodanthe? I think I just went through that in some detail about the funding and, and how beach nourishment works. Uh, is there a project scheduled for Rodanthe? There is not a project scheduled for Rodanthe uh, for the reasons we just talked about. Um, has erosion always been an issue in this area, and ha or has it worsened in recent years? It has always been an issue there. Um, the, the saving grace in the past has been DOT took responsibility there after we lost the road, I don't know how many times, but when we lost it the last time for, I don't know, 45 or 60 days and really shut things down, you know, they did a nourishment project. They put sheet pile down. They did some things to protect in that area, uh, and so they had tried to solve problems for there, but with the building of the bridge and the removal of that road, uh, they're no longer taking that responsibility. Uh, and we believe that, that the erosion rate has in fact worsened there. The, the rate of loss there is much greater than it was 10 years ago. Now we'll find out with this study, because that study was done in 2013, but anecdotally, and if you live here and you've been down there, I would say you would agree with me that it has accelerated uh, in that amount of time. Um, what stretch of beach would be nourished as a part of the potential Rodanthe Beach Nourishment Project? What I just showed you is just what I picked out of the sky. The engineers would pick it. The way you build a project is you build it and you cover the area you want to cover and then you do a taper out on each end so that it doesn't, you don't want a, a wall. That wall will erode faster so you taper it down and they'll give you a length. And, but the engineering based on the erosion rates and the width of your project and all those sorts of things will determine how big that taper is. But that two and a quarter miles, two and a half miles, something like that is roughly uh, 
the length of the project. Um, you know, we may have problems on the northern end trying to taper into the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. They, are, they aren't keen on us doing nourishment in the, in the refuge, but that's another hurdle we'll cross when we get to it. But again, the length will be determined by the engineers and, and how do we do it so that we can hold that if we pick a 100-foot beach, a 100-foot beach for that five-year period. Um, has Dare County considered other options such as the installation of terminal groins or jetties or seawalls? Um, we, I have met, and some of our commissioners have met with companies that do this kind of stuff, and there's probably not a month or two that goes by that I don't get something from some of those people. Our issue is that North Carolina doesn't allow any hardened structures on the beach, so there's only two methods on the ocean front that you can do to protect anything. You can do beach nourishment, and you can do temporary sandbags if you meet the criteria that's in the Coastal Resources Commission rules about whether you can place sandbags on your property or not. And those are the only two tools that are available to property owners on the ocean front to protect their property from the erosion of the ocean under North Carolina law. And so for us to use any other hardened structure, whether it's a, you know, there's geotubes and there's uh, energy attenuation devices that you put out further in the surf to dissipate the energy before the wave action hits the beach, there is a number of things out there that have been tried in the Netherlands and other places that may or may not work in this environment, but they've never been tried. But we don't have the authority to do any of those things. Um, we have talked over the years. Uh, I've mentioned it to the Coastal Resources Commission several times. Uh, I've mentioned it to the NC Byways that I sit on as well. Um, Jet was on the CRAC with me. It was brought up at times there as well. Um, to, when do we begin the discussion about other tools? Because one day we're going to use up all the sand that's close enough that we can put it on the beach. One day it's going to be too expensive not only to do new projects but do the projects that we've got to do. And what do we do then? What are our tools then? And if we don't start having that conversation now, whenever then gets here, we're going to be in trouble because it's going to take a long time to get from discussion to approval of those tools. And so we're trying to get that discussion going. Uh, I'll tell you, we've had a difficult time getting anybody to engage with us that, that is really willing to work to make that happen, but it isn't for lack of effort on our side. Um, what is the process moving forward with the project and what are the next steps? Well, the next step for us is to get the, this study done, which we should have in the next 60 days or so, I would hope, and put a price tag on it. And once we have a price tag, then we know what we're asking for and we can publicize that number. And then those of us that know our legislators and those of us, whether they're from our district, many of you are from other places, you may have legislators that you know in, in your area, we can start working on our government, our federal government and our state government to try to help us begin funding this project. We then will know what we need. We'll know if that's a $30 million problem or a $35 million problem or what is our problem. But you got to know that to know what to ask for. And so we'll have that and, and those are our next step. Um, the next question, how much would it cost? I've talked about that a couple of times. Um, there's a question, what are the chances that the contractors working to clear the sandbags and debris from the section at the S-curves could be paid to create an inlet opening at the S-curves while they are already there doing the extra work? The assumption in that question is that if we cut an inlet there that all of a sudden we're going to solve a problem. I think if you live in a green dolphin, you might think maybe that isn't a great idea. <laughs> um, um, so, so, and even if we thought it was a good idea, maybe it is, I don't know. To do that would require us to get all kind. You don't just go out and cut an inlet across an island, and, and you'd have to go through a huge permitting process. There would be a lot of steps to go, and you'd have to have something definitive that said, yeah, if you did that, that would somehow solve a problem. Uh, what we have found, to be honest with you, with inlets is if you go to Ocracoke, Oregon Inlet, pretty much any inlet in North Carolina, the north south side of the inlet that faces to the northeast are roads everywhere, not just here. And so creating an inlet there 
basically would happen the same thing that happens uh, at Oregon Inlet on the south side. It would erode and create pro more problems maybe than, than we already have. Having that sand up there that doesn't break in the island keeps the wave action deflected instead of coming right in uh, directly at the houses. So unlikely that that would be done, unlikely that we have a time frame that we could do that in that would make any sense, even if it could be done. Um, why aren't state or federal dollars being used for beach, to fund beach nourishment? I've talked about that. Um, I don't know. I think the, the why is, I know at the state level, the why is trying to identify a recurring source of funds because it doesn't do them us much good for us them to give me $5 million next year. I can't build a project with $5 million. And I got to have money that, that I know is coming in in those annual amounts so that we can cobble together funding to build a project. And if they can't do that in recurring amounts, then they haven't helped us with $5 million this year and $3 million six years from now and, and those kind of numbers. We need a recurring funding source there. Their problem is they don't have a, re, a recurring funding or haven't identified one. Um, we we're working on that with them. Um, we had a meeting of the NC Byways earlier in the week. Uh, we had some discussions about that. Uh, there was a former uh, legislator from down in, in Craven County who was active in that area, and she's going to hopefully help us. We're going to ask her for some help there, and we'll see where that leads us on the state level. And on the federal level, I don't know that anyone's ever explained to us why we could never get into a federal project other than they're not adding any new projects to the federal budget. Um, uh, what plans, if any, does the county have to deal with erosion, especially storm erosion on the, on the south side of Hatteras? Um, we don't have a plan. I mean, we, on, the, on the sound side, private property owners have opportunities to do things to protect their property that people on the ocean front don't. You can't build a bulkhead on the ocean front. You can build a bulkhead on your property on the sound side. Uh, you, can, you can do things that protect your property. And so if we're going to subsidize something and use our money for something, we need to put it in those places where the people can't help themselves. And for us, that was the ocean front and not the sound side. So we haven't had any plans there to do uh, nourishment on the sound side. Um, does any entity have plans to protect that stretch of homes near Green Lantern Court to protect the inlet from cutting just north of Rodanthe? Uh, that protection is part of what would be a Rodanthe nourishment project. And to protect that area is going to require nourishment in that area, and to nourish it requires money, and we've, we've talked about that. Um, does the county plan to work with uh, North Carolina Coastal Federation to promote and pursue living shoreline methods to mitigate and mitigate damage and erosion from sounds high flooding? We're always happy to work with them. Uh, we've been working with them on a number of issues up to now, and, and certainly if there's something we can do to help them uh, with those living shorelines, then you know we're available to have those discussions. And I know we there was one done up in Kitty Hawk that's been good. I think we were involved in one that's done down in Hatteras a few years ago. Um, and so yeah, as those come up and and do it, then you know we'll do our part as we did down in Hatteras. Um, let's see. Hang on. Some more questions. <laughs> Let's see. Probably up here is the type of question too. Which one was that? About the purchase. Uh, oh, okay. Did I skip a page? Yeah, you skipped. No, you didn't skip a page. Just uh, the answer is Encore. We've been working with Encore since back in the summer for the buyout program. And I think when Dave Halleck came down here and talked several months ago, we, we brought that up and we were working on that then. Um, the bad news is what we found out in, in our work with them is uh, and we finally got sort of the final answer last week, but but they cut the the, the funds that were going to be $180, $180 million were cut to $120 million. They cut $60 million out of the fund. Don't know why, don't know what, but they did. So now there's $120 million of funds available. Um, with that $120 million of funds, the rules require them to use 50% of that for underserved communities. We're not an underserved community. And we don't meet that definition. So that $120 million is now cut to $60 million. Uh, of that $60 million, they're then required to use that 
and I can't remember whether this is Hurricane Matthew or Dorian money. Do you remember, Dave? Matthew. 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 So, so this is money that came as a result of Hurricane Matthew. And so they're required to use it in the affected areas first. So they're going to go to those areas. We weren't one of the affected areas in Matthew. And so when you go there, then the last criteria is they're going to use it for primary residence first. And so when you plug all those criteria and, and we went through it with them and what they projected as a cost, what they told us was while we're not absolutely excluded, it's very unlikely that there would be money available after all that to come in and do something with second homes on the oceanfront in Dare County. And that if we were relying on that, that we might have our reliance misplaced. Um, and so that's probably off the table uh, to do anything, at least out of the in core money. Okay. Um, some more questions that I got in a sheet tonight. Uh, there was an appropriation act for the National Park Service. I think I talked about that. They've got some requests in for money out of that fund, and we'll see what happens there. Next question, is there an occupancy tax increase that can get us close to paying that? Uh, the answer is no. The only way to increase the occupancy tax is to um, go to the legislature and ask them to increase it. Um, the last time we went to ask for that, we were told not only no, but H no, and don't come back anymore. And I'll tell you that the, the state... Yeah, the, the, yeah. the state tourism board lobby is, is strong, and they lobbied hard against any community, not just DARE, but anybody, increasing the oxy tax and putting any more burden on the tourism community uh, to pay taxes. And so we haven't and won't get anywhere there. Um, why was the proposed buyout at 470, not market rate? I, the, the buyout was 470 because the statute said that was the limit of what they could spend irrespective of the market rate. So that was their limit. But given that's not available any longer, then that really doesn't matter. Um, why can't the buyout money be reallocated towards beach nourishment? Um, again, the money's not available, but the answer to the question is when Congress allocates money for a purpose, it can only be used for that purpose. So I can't ask them for buy out money to, to remove a house and then turn around and do something else with it. Um, if, if you want it to be available for other purposes, then you've got to go to Congress and let them identify the purposes for which it can be used. And if it included nourishment, then you could use it for that, but it does not. Um, let's see. NPS and Derek often commit that Bucks and, and Avon receive nourishment due to high with 12 being impassable. All right, so that question deals with permitting requirements. For us to get a permit to do beach nourishment anywhere within the park, um, the park won't let us do, the, the, not Dave Havoc, not the local park, but the rules from the Department of Interior say that you can't do nourishment uh, to protect private property. You have to do it to protect public infrastructure. And so in Avon and Buxton, our projects were designed to protect Highway 12 and to keep them open. And so we were able to get permits by arguing that we needed those projects. And as a result, those oceanfront properties got a benefit, but that could not have been the primary goal of our, prop of our project or we would not have gotten the permits. In Rodanthe, we've got infrastructure that could be at risk. We've got a water plant on that side of the road. So we've got big infrastructure. So I don't think we're going to have an issue with an infrastructure problem. Um, the purpose for the jug handle bridge was to eliminate the road that DOT had to do all that work with dunes and sheet pile and all that to protect. And so that took that stretch of the road from where they just cut it off at Green Dolphin North out of the area that has infrastructure in it. So it's gonna be hard to permit a project for a road that doesn't exist anymore. Um, are there any funds available for short-term preventions like sandbags for immediate imperiled homes? There are not. Um, sandbagging is like bulkheading. Sandbagging is something that you can do as a private property owner if you meet the criteria that, that's uh, under the rules from the coastal management. Um, they have been used in lots of places. If you go to Buxton, uh, they're at the hotel. They've got sandbags all in there. They did. They're covered now with a nurturement project. Uh, if you go down to Topsail Island, they've got a project 
probably worse than what you have in Rodanthe. Uh, they've got sandbags as high as the ceiling uh, stacked up at the north end of their inlet where it's eroding there. Uh, there are rules about that. Uh, theoretically, they're temporary in nature. They can't be your long-term forever solution. Um, you have to have some plan of action that tells them that one day those bags will come out. And so I don't know all the rules, but there are a number of them. But that is something that you as an individual property owner would have to do if you want to do that. Um, there's a question about reef balls. That goes back to the hardened structures that I talked about before. You know, reef balls are really what are energy attenuators, and the idea of a reef ball is you put them out in the surf, and, and it dissipates the wave energy before it hits the beach and prevents you from having erosion. It also kills your waves, and so the surfers will be upset, and, 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 and nobody really knows what it does to fishing. So, so those are some issues, but again, we can't do hardened structures, so we can't do that. Um, this ask, have we done anything to change that? And I, I've already talked about that a little bit. Uh, is there a plan to put up large condominiums or hotels? Not that I'm aware of. Um, so, um, and then, and then, what laws can be changed to help? And you know, at at the local level, the laws that can be changed to help are, are laws that would allow us to at least study and look at you know other tools that we can do uh, to mitigate uh, the effects of erosion. And, be, and, and other than just beach nourishment alone. And you know, maybe those are more affordable, maybe those are more long-term, and maybe they, you know, they would give us some longer-term relief. Um, with that, that's every question that we've received that I know about, right, Caitlin? Um, and so we'll go through and go to you all next. If you all have a question, uh, if you raise your hand, you'll have to come to the podium, You're coming to the podium so that we can, one, we can hear you. Oh, is this our list of people? Oh, I'll call on you then. Yeah. Bobby, I got a, I got a mic. Yeah. The chairman will bring you a mic. You'll speak from the podium so that you're on camera and so that we can pick you up for what we're doing. Okay. Okay. Um, if I get your name wrong, I apologize. Um, I'm going to keep your questions Keep your questions or your comments brief, um, and please, we've got one, two, three, we've got about, I'm looking at rough, maybe 50 people that want to speak, and so if we're going to get out of here before tomorrow morning, we got to, and give everybody a chance to talk, uh, we've got to keep it going. So, uh, and we're going to, I'm holding while they fix the microphone. Testing, I just, testing, testing, can everybody hear? Okay. Are we set? Yeah. We're All right, set. everybody. Um, so I'm going to call down the list and call on everybody who signed up. When I call on you, uh, come up, please ask your question. If, if you're making a comment, please keep it brief. Uh, we're going to, if you get up close to three minutes, we're going to cut you off because if we got 50 people for three minutes, we're going to be here a while. So. Uh, again, ask your question. We'll try to answer it. If I've already answered it, please don't ask it again. Uh, and if I answer it, your question, then whoever's behind you, if you're going to ask the same thing, you don't need to answer, ask it twice. So with that said, I'll go. The first person is, is looks like John Kacha. John, K-O-C-H-T-A. John in the room. All right. Next is John Gorell, G-O-R-R-E-L-L. -L. All right, uh, Jennifer Holmes. Okay, thanks, Jennifer. Jeff Carroll. Okay. P Peter Shep. <laughs> Peter Shepard. Can you come up so we can pick you up? The, the $6 million, could you use that for buyout? No. It can only be used for beach nourishment. Okay. Yep. Um, frankly, and that's by statute. That's not our policy. That's what the state statute says that allowed us to have that 2% occupancy tax. Okay. Um, Frank Lynn. Okay. Peter, ha I mean, I'm sorry, Pat Hastings. 
Okay. Uh, Kat Stevens. Uh, Danny Lacates. And Casey Lacates. Okay. Randy Hill. Wow. Uh, Drew or Rose McLaughlin. Okay. Uh, Cal Baniak. More of a comment, just the, sure. the overwhelming theme here is this is a Rodanthe issue. This is a Hatteras Island issue. It's about access to the island, and you touched on the canal zone uh, down in Frisco and here. What happens here with any sort of medium swell event, we have ocean overwash that's going to come right at the access to the jug handle circle. It's going to close that road. That has nothing to do with the houses, anything like that. It has to do with accessibility. So I understand how things have done in the past and you've been hit with a brick wall. I would just ask you to try to explore all options, not just looking at Rodanthe, but whether it's a special assessment or something that we could try to revisit again, even though they said no, we can't just give up. This is going to affect not just Rodanthe, but the entire Hatteras Island. Well taken. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Derek Hend. Oh, okay, Kathleen Kozman. I just want to ask, um, is there any kind of a small project that we could do to at least stop, like the gentleman just said, the water coming in on Corbina and the water coming in on other places? I only know of Ocean Drive and Corbina. But is there any way that you could get sandbags there, dunes back up, or something? As uh, a small project, just for road dante for the whole What we area. can do there is we can, so in the past we've worked with DOT because anytime there's a break in that dune, when you have overwash, that's the hole that comes in. If you've got one break, then it comes in and it flows to the north or to the south and covers the road. And if you can fill that break, if DOT can fill that break, then in smaller events, we can keep the ocean side without getting in the road. In a larger event, we're basically holding back the dike with your thumb for a day or two, but eventually it's going to break. And so, yes, something like that may can be done, and we'll have that conversation with DOT. The other part is, like on Ocean Drive, that's the only road that I know because my house is on there, but... Uh, you know, the road is in jeopardy eventually. So is there any way we can get sandbags there as a small project? And there might be other places that could use the sandbag just to well, help a little bit. Every property owner has the right to do sandbagging if you meet the criteria for the sandbags. But I'm talking about the road. Right. Because the road goes north and south. So and so it's... You know, I only, we only have a small beach area there, and so that's why I'm saying if you can put the sandbags, it would prevent that road from going and maybe other roads that are going north and south that are close to the shore to keep people at least getting in and out of their properties. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know permitting-wise what the rules are if you're not... I'm, I'm a little bit familiar with what you do on the ocean front. I'm not familiar with what you would do if it's not an ocean front sandbag project. I, I don't know. I'll try to find out for you. Yeah, that would be nice if you sure. could do smaller projects to at least protect some of the other houses here. Right. I know some of the ones that are in the ocean, we can't do much about that, but right. you know, we could prevent the ones that are in the next row. Okay. I'll check with DOT on that. Thank you. Thank you. Bob, before we move forward, I, I think it's important that the last gentleman had a comment, and I, I need to address that because, yes, we, we are concerned about all of Hatteras Island. About a year and a half ago, I established a task force, an NC-12 task force. It involved Superintendent Halleck, and it, it involved, involved the Environmental uh, Law Center, and involved all of our uh, stakeholders to study the hot spots in, in, on, on Hatteras Island. There are about eight hot spots. 
A subcommittee was led by the county manager. They studied that for over a year. We've just uh, had a written report uh, from the subcommittee to the NC-12 task force. We will be hopefully holding a meeting in the next couple of weeks to address that uh, findings from the subcommittee. And then it's my goal as the chair of the, of the task force to ask those members to try to find funding sources to solve those hotspots. So hopefully that answered your question. We, we are very much aware that it's not just a rodanthe, it's a Harris issue. All right, um, Jeff and Diana Spear. All right, Brad Manson. Okay, Amy Kramer. First off, thank you very much for holding this and having the sense of urgency around this. It is really very important. As you said, your, your comment about the requirements to do a project, what was really powerful for me is where do we need it the most? And then what is the impact that it's having to Outer Banks and our tourism? And so when we look at what we need here in Rodanthe, this isn't just impacting all of us who, who live here. And I live here just so that people know that it's not just rental homes that are being impacted by it, it is actual people who call this location our home, is that the, um, sorry, <laughs> I just got myself caught off by thinking about my home. Um, it's that we have to think about the impact that it's gonna make it to the rest of the community of having Rodanthe show up on radio, television, times, uh, photos saying that there's such an issue here. This, this isn't just, again, impacting us. It's not just impacting the fact that if you want to come on this island and get onto any other part of Hatteras Island, you've got to be able to get through Rodanthe. And so hopefully as a community, not just Rodanthe, you can help us to pull together the entire Outer Banks community to sure. support us in this. Sure. So thank you for that. Thank you. And, and you're right. As we prioritize, that is definitely a factor that goes into the prioritization process, so you're, you're right on the dot there. So, um, Jet Farabee? First of all, commissioners and, and Mr. Alton, that was a great, this is a great meeting. I think we all needed this. We appreciate y'all listening to us. There's a lot that we didn't know that we do know now, so thank you. I'd still like to read some comments just because I think, to me, it's become very apparent that this is a federal issue and should have a federal solution. So, Senator Tillis's train, you there? And um, Congressman Murphy. Anyway, I, I just want to go through some things. So, Superintendent Hall Halleck at the last Coast Resource Commission stated that in 2021, Cape Powder's visitor economic spending contribution was $226 million, second in the nation only to California. This number, while impressive, is only a fraction of the economic value of this national asset. Superintendent Halleck rightfully boasted that the beaches of Hatteras Island were home to 300 to 500 sea turtle nests, hundreds of imperiled shoreline, shoreline net, shorebird nests as well as critical shorebird habitat. With no beach, there will be no visitors, there'll be no sea turtles, there'll be no, no critical shorebird habitat. Now, when the Park Service started in Superintendent Howland's settlement plan for Cape Hatteras, and I encourage you all to read that, it's very informative, coastal retreat or abandonment by the National Park Service would not allow for recreation and enjoyment by the public at the seashore. In order to manage and preserve the nation's national park lands, Congress passed the National Park Service Organic Act in 1916. Specifically, the act declares that the National Park Service has a dual mission, both to conserve park resources and provide for the use and enjoyment in such a manner and by means, such means as will leave them unimpaired for future generations. Coastal retreat or abandonment of the seashore may constitute an impairment and may violate both the seashore's enabling legislation as well as the Organic Act. 
For these reasons, coastal retreat and abandonment were not carried forward for detailed analysis in the settlement plan. So when you've lost the entire national seashore in front of Rodanthia, I would declare that that's an impairment of our national park system. And so it really behooves me that Dare County is trying to fund the creation of or the whatever of the National Park Service land. It's their land, it's not their counties. And if we don't re-nourish it, Park Service, the way the laws are working, they then get to take the private land. So as they ignore their land and not re-nourish it, not put up sand fence and not plant sea oats, they then start taking private property and the property line changes. So I think that's why this issue is different than Nags Head, Kill Devil Hills, Kitty Hawk. I mean, all of those communities, Southern Shores, Kitty Hawk, Kill Devil Hills, they've been renourished twice now. Nags Head, three times. Buxton, twice. And Rodanthe, we're sitting down here because we're an unincorporated village. We really don't have a lot of representation looking out for us. And so I guess what... And, and look, when I say that, I see Bobby's look on his face. Bobby, thank you. What you've done is great. What you've done for Dare County is amazing. I just think we need some federal help. And so if the county can't afford it, I sent y'all an email of all the different funding opportunities. I'm going to real quickly go through it because this is where... So you're getting close Murphy's to your three minutes. <laughs> Hang on. Go ahead. Okay. So, so this is where our congressmen and representatives need, need to step up plate and help us. Inflation Reduction Act authorized $1 billion, Now, all of this is stuff that's passed in the last two years. $1 billion for the National Park Service to respond to climate change. In this was, this is the Inflation Reduction Act, $2.6 billion for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration to restore and protect coastal communities and marine habitats, allowing communities near parks to prepare for extreme storms and other changing climate conditions. The Great American Outdoorsman Act provides $1.9 billion per year for five years to make significant enhancements to national parks and other public lands, ensuring their preservation, which takes us back to the Organic Act, where they're supposed to preserve their shoreline. The Land and Water Conservation Fund, $900 million a year, provides states with money to invest in local conservation and recreation opportunities. The Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, $1.73 billion over the next five years. Now, this is money allocated to National Park Service. This law provides billions of dollars in discretionary grant programs available that will help fund bridge replacements and resiliency projects, build wildlife crossings, keep people and wildlife safe. Um, climate and severe, uh, the law invests in critical transportation infrastructure climate and weather resiliency, projects that will improve the resiliency of transportation infrastructure to sea level rise and severe weather events. That would be the canal zone. That would be that Isabel. Um, then just recently in December, they passed the Consolidated Appropriations Act. National Park Service would receive the discretionary appropriations of 3.475 billion dollars in the fiscal year of 2023. 1.5 billion is to support recovery from local natural disasters at parks. So I'm just telling you, Congress has billions and billions of dollars that is set aside for park service. We're just looking for 20, 30 million to protect. <laughs> <laughs> And, 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 you know, it's not their county shoreline that we're putting back. It's their shoreline that they're mandated by the Organic Act to put back and preserve and keep 
for future generations. The money is there. It doesn't have to come from taxing us. And, and by me, I don't mind increase my taxes. We need to save Rodanthe. It's that simple. Thank you. And thank, thank you. you for what you did tonight. You. Matt, you still have your three minutes. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Thanks for being here this evening. Uh, this is, uh, quite honestly, a testament that the county does care about Rodanthe, and I can tell you that there are a lot of people that just aren't sure of that one way or the other. So thank you, and thank you, everybody. My question is around the model. Obviously, as you have described this model this evening, and I, for one, really appreciate it, it sounds like the model doesn't work for the Tri-Villages for various reasons. Maybe it will in the future, but as of right now, it doesn't. Would the county or the board look at a potential working group with select homeowners, people a lot smarter than myself, the Park Service, Fish and Wildlife, NCDOT, to come together to try to create a model because the one that has been successful in the rest of Dare County doesn't seem like it's going to work here in the villages. So that's my question. Would you be willing to do that? So the answer is I'm sure we'd be willing to meet with the people of Rodanthe like we always do. When we have a hurricane, we'll come down here and meet and talk. If we have nourishment problems, we'll come. So that's not an issue. I think you misunderstand what the model is uh, in simple terms. We projected revenues out for 15 years. Right. And we've done those projections. They may be conservative. We're using 2016, 17, 18, 19 growth rates that grow our uh, oxy tax at those rates. Uh, and we projected those rates out into the future. So that's our only revenue source. And so we look at that and say, if those assumptions hold true, this is how much money we'll have over time. Um, similarly, we've been to our engineers and say, with the projects that we've already done, what's it going to cost us to maintain those on those five-year intervals that we plan? And they've taken the cost, the per cubic yard cost of sand, an inflation factor, and other things, and plug those in on the expenditure side. And then you compare those. And if you compare those and they either zero out or you have excess funds, then you're, you're good. You've done what you needed to do. Holding those truths that I talked about in the beginning, holding that one year of debt service in abeyance. We've used debt service as a way to leverage those funds further rather than trying to spend it all in one tranche of money up front. And so that gives us the ability to do more with less, if you will, by extending the time of that. But you can't borrow it. It's like you don't want to go buy your car on a 30-year note. So you can't borrow the money beyond the life of your project, or you shouldn't. Right. Um, it's not prudent. And so we keep it to those five-year intervals, and that allows us to, to leverage it. And so all of those things and others are plugged inflation, everything else is plugged into that model to project, really, it doesn't tell us where to do nourishment or who gets the money. It just tells us how much money do we have available. And so having a working group or whoever else is a good idea for trying to figure out how we move forward in Rodanthe. It does nothing to tell us how much money do we have because we, we know that from basically running the model. And, and we've run... 38 iterations, Dave, at least, of that model. So every time something changes, if we get a slug of money and it goes in the fund, then we rerun the model to see what does that do to the fund. If we um, save money, if a project comes in other, under budget and we have money left in the fund, then what does it do to the fund? Uh, our agreement with all of the towns are any savings on a project comes back to the fund, not to the town. Uh, our agreement with the towns is any overage on a project is paid by the town and not by the fund. And so 
we're protecting the fund to keep it as viable and as long-term as we can. And each time something happens or something changes, we redo the model. We were able to do Avon because we got, and the towns all got, a million and a half, a million seven in FEMA money. Uh, that was a windfall to the town. It wasn't plugged in the money. We reduced our contributions to the town so that we could take advantage of that money that they got, use that in the model to be able to fund another project. So we, we do this often and we run the model often to keep up with how we go. Our issue is this project is going to be our one of our most Huge. expensive ones. Right. And with the growth rates that we project, it, it, we aren't going to grow that fund that fast as I talked to earlier. And that's our dilemma is how do we get an injection of money? Because if we got that $30 million, that would fund those 10-year intervals. And I'm using $30 million as an example, so don't go out and tell me it's $30 million because we don't have the engineering. It might be right. $40 million when we get the engineering, but we need that slug of money to, to plug into the fund with growth and interest and all those things that are in that model. It can carry us and do those five-year things as well as build the project. And so that's how that model works. Okay. Oh. So not to completely put anyone here on the spot, but based on the model as it is this evening, uh, and based on a guesstimate of 30 million, which to be honest, sounds low, yeah. right? Uh, and if Rodanthe became the highest of the three current priorities that their county has, and who knows if other priorities may end up popping up within the meantime, what time frame would it be realistic are we looking at five years? Are we no, looking at 10 years? Or? At 3% growth, you're talking about the annual growth in the OxyTax fund for beach nourishment of less than $500,000 a year. Okay. So $500,000 a year means it takes two years to get a million dollars. If you need 30, that means 60 years. So that fund is not going to grow sufficiently to, so, so then, so, so that's why back we, to my original question. Yeah, so we're question. back to where do we get these, yeah. are, and, and Jed is right. We've got to go right, right. to. Back to my original question. It's not that the model's not strong and vibrant and it's working for the county, but the way that everything has been done successfully in the past is not going to help. What you're suggesting, villages. I believe, is that we take money that is allocated, say, to Kitty Hawk and put it in Rodanthe and then let Kitty Hawk suffer the burden or, the, no. or whatever happens. So, well, no, sir, I wasn't thinking okay, that. I so, was thinking of come up, coming up with, and I don't have any idea what they are, coming up with an alternative, an alternative <coughs> idea, whatever that might be, through this working group. I think when you have more people, sorry, when you have more people coming together with ideas, you might be able to create a different type of model that might work. We would be glad to listen to any ideas that anybody has, and if they've got a better idea, you know, we have no pride in authorship. We'd be glad to, to, to make it work if, if there's a way to do that. So, Sounds great. Yeah. Thank you. And, and Bobby, let me just say to your comments, um, in all due respect, when you say you don't have any representation, nobody works any harder than that man sitting right there on our board, Danny Couch, the Hatter's Island. Nobody works any harder than this board. We have tackled more issues in the last 10 years in Dare County. It's ever been done in the last 50 years. So, in all due respect to you, that's not a very good comment so, uh, that say you get no representation. I'm not looking for an answer from you. I'm willing to sit down and talk to you personally. I said that before this meeting. I'll sit down with you anytime and discuss it. Trey Lewis, Leslie, take that list. You get it from him. Talk to your senator. It's not because we haven't tried. I can't tell you how many times 
Our board has gone to D.C. and talked to our federal legislators without any success whatsoever. No, no disrespect to them. Their hands are tied. But if, if, if in fact it's true with the numbers that he's given, then, I'm not, then we need to seek help from our legislators to go after those funds and try to nourish Rodanthe. Uh, and on that issue, Dave, he's going to tell you, with all those billions of dollars, he, they're, they're competing. Go ahead, Dave. Tell them. Yeah. So, so really, uh, thank you for, for having sure. me up here. I'm Dave Halleck. For those of you who haven't met me, we've been in this room with hundreds of people over the last uh, six to 12 months. And obviously, this is an important issue that everybody cares deeply about. It is true there are lots of large funding pots that are both available to the Department of Interior agencies and the Park Service. It's also just useful for you to understand there are 424 national parks in the system. They represent 85 million acres and the existing deferred maintenance backlog of the National Park Service. These are things that have been broken for years and years and years and have not been able to be fixed is 22 billion. Just here at Cape Hatteras Seashore, we have tens of millions of dollars of maintenance backlog. Uh, we are not ignoring this problem, but part of my job is to provide facts, and the other part of my job is to manage expectations. It is unlikely that the National Park Service is gonna allocate some of the money that Mr. Farabee mentioned for a beach nourishment project for the following reason. Bobby mentioned very clearly that when you get into the business of beach nourishment, it's not one and done. You've got to keep doing the project. So if the Department of Interior found $30 million to do this project, the expectation, of course, is in five years? $30 million would fund it forever. Okay. Yeah. 30 million forever. Yeah. Uh, but, <laughs> I, I, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. Wow. <laughs> I got a bridge to sell you. <laughs> you like that bridge that just came over? Uh, the expectation is that that would be a resilience uh, implementation that would be a lasting uh, solution. We have asked for some funding to help with Hatteras Island Highway 12 hotspots. The Canal Zone and Pea Island Visitor Center is, are two of the seven. The area between Frisco Village and Hatteras Village is a very fragile area where the highway is closed a lot. And that all, not only uh, is important for transportation to Hatteras Village, but also to Ocracoke Island, which is part of the seashore. Um, and then the north end of Ocracoke Island, if you've been there lately, has a tremendous erosion problem uh, in which we have over a mile of highway that is sandbagged. So we are looking, if we can get funding, to try to help with those community-wide transportation solutions. It doesn't mean that Rodanthe is not a need that is acknowledged, um, but it is hard to invest in a beach nourishment project that would likely only last three to five years when there are these other problems that are out there in which an investment would last for a long period of time. So I'm just sharing that with you because I want you to know some of the challenges associated with getting money for beach nourishment on a National Park Service beach. Let's, let's, let me go down. I got yeah, you more got people. Some more. Yeah, so, all right. One last thing, just to make it clear. The $30 million number I used is a number I made up. It's not a real number. The, the second thing is, my example with $30 million assumed a $20 million project. So you got a $20 million construction the other 10 million is to cover those other two parameters. So if you had 30 million by our model, it would cover in the five-year increments the maintenance going forward, and it would also cover and allow us to have that cushion that we need to pay for a bad season. Dave's signaling me that we've run the model through two cycles, so it would run through two nourishment cycles at least. Uh, under the model, so just to make that clear. So I'm going to go on now. Um, those of you that are online, if we didn't get to your question tonight and we didn't answer, please send us an email with your question. Uh, we'll answer it directly back to you, and we'll also post your question, if it's not already on the website, on the website with an answer so that everybody else can share in it too. Um, with that said, since we can't do these, are there other questions here in the room? I think I see one hand. If you come up and say who you are. And... Yeah. Um, Matt Story. I'm from Clayton, North Carolina, so just south of Raleigh. I'm not friends with any legislators. 
sadly. Um, so maybe slightly unpopular, but if I can just pivot away from the mitigation and the nourishment for a moment, um, the whole world knows that we lost two homes into the or three homes into the ocean in 2022, all on Ocean Drive. Subsequently, um, the beach is still not clean. Right? It's a, it's an immense safety issue. Thirty million dollars is a lot of money to clean up the beach. Is is a pittance compared, right? And it's still not clean. No offense, Dave. There's a forty thousand dollar beach rake that's collecting dust. It's probably the maintenance guy's fault, but that the feds, federal government, had invested in, right? The beach rake has not been out since I think the homes fell. It'd be nice to get that sucker out, Dave. We can talk about it after. I, it's, I didn't mean to um, <clears throat> catch you off guard there, but there's still a charcoal grill out there. Uh, every time I go for a walk, I'm picking up lumber. There's no local area to actually throw away the lumber, so you got to take it down to Buxton, right? It's got nails in it. Luckily, uh, Brad Hansen and the folks at the Rodanthe Pier were nice enough, excuse me, were nice enough to allow, allow me to, <laughs> to Thank you, Ray. I don't think I've hit my three minutes yet, but uh, to allow me to throw some of that lumber away, didn't come off my property, um, recently invested an immense amount of money, about $80, in a Ryobi, <laughs> in a Ryobi Sawzall, and I've been cutting off conduit when I take walks. Guys, this is, please, walk, walk with me. And this is on National Park Service property, typically speaking, if, if the foreshore and, and high tide, right? Um, let's clean the damn beach. Just get that clean in the meanwhile. So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks. Other questions from the group? You're okay. Okay. Um, other questions? If you have a question... Please raise, I don't see any other hand. You got a question, Jet? Yes. I, I left this out. Stand up. We can't. You got to go to the mic. And ma'am, you, you had a question. I'll give you a second go to. I apologize to the commissioners when I, my comment wasn't that we weren't represented by you. It's just I've been in a lot of conversations with Nags Head, Kitty Hawk, Kill Devil Hill. They've got a staff that looks at beach renourishment and doing the planning and all that you're doing. Rodanthe doesn't have that personal staff. That's all I meant. Yes, I didn't do. mean it. That's us. Uh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So the other thing I didn't mention is we don't have a tax base here to make this happen, correct? Correct. So Park Service pays no taxes. They pay a $60,000 payment in loot. So I guess I'm going to keep coming back to it. It's a federal beach. It's a federal problem. We don't have the tax base to make it happen. They're the largest landowner in all of Dare County. They pay $60,000 a year. That's all. I cut you off. If, did you have another question? Sure. I just wanted to yeah. know Come, this can you? I appreciate um, Hi, Amy Kramer. Um, and as I said, I'm a full-time resident here, so a very important topic for me. And I really appreciate the expectation setting because I, and I want us all to get to not the, a conclusion. I want us all to get to a solution. Um, so when I heard you listing out all of those opportunities and needs, 46 parks, I think you said, by the amount of that money, if you divided that, sound like a whole lot to me. 424. 424 still. That seems like really a pretty good math when you equal that out. But... When you were talking about specifically the, the needs within um, Hatteras Island, um, I didn't understand where is Rodanthe in the list of that priorities. I know you've asked for money. Thank you for doing that. But where are we in the list in comparison to all those others that have needs? So uh, great question. So Rodanthe was considered one of the Highway 12 hotspots. And that's the, that is the perspective or the lens at which we looked at these problems. We did not look at problem areas in regard to homes that were threatened next to Cape Hatteras National Seashore. We looked at highway issues. So we selected those three highway issues because they appeared to be the most pervasive, significant issues that affected the largest number of visitors, emergency services, even food delivery, and things like that. Uh, other, I mean, we've had numerous people say, Dave, when are we getting a beach nourishment from Hatteras Village? Uh, I'm not sure you walked in front of Hatteras Village. They're only a few years away from this same situation, perhaps. We've had many people ask, when's the next beach nourishment occurring in front of Christian? So, uh, 
So I'm just pointing out that many of the residents in all of the villages have the same concerns. Um, the beach is eroding fast, not just in front of Rodan. It is only an issue in Rodan because the homes are now intersecting with the ocean. Uh, the same erosion rate occurs in many places of the seashore. And it's just that uh, intersection, of course, with the development and the ocean that causes the significant issue. And obviously a major concern to property owners. So those are the only three projects that have been, requests have been made. And from our estimates and, and hearing from DOT, just those projects alone are potentially, you know, more than a billion dollars with a B. Um, so we're, we're focused on trying to get sustainable transportation solutions in those areas. In the areas that, isn't that includes, I'm just sorry, I'm, I'm just making sure, I'm, sure there's full clarity for me. And the area of Rodanthe is one of those areas that are you concerned about the roads, is that correct? That is, we are concerned about secondary roads like everybody is, but the primary purpose of our effort was to look at the Highway 12 hotspots that is the primary route of transportation. And according to NCDOT, they, I don't know how much they spent, 125 or 150 million, they have solved the Rodanthe Highway 12 hotspot. No question. That, <laughs> Um, so I just just to say that in another way, then then the, then you haven't requested you've requested money yes. for our neighbors. Wonderful, we're we're not, a community not for the here. Neighbors for three transportation hotspots, which will impact our neighbors, but not for the issues that are impacting Rodanthe, because there then there is not in, an expectation of an effect to the highway. Is that correct? So Rodanthe is not one of the areas you've requested money for. That's correct. Thank but you. one last thing, he's not the only one asking for money. So we're asking for money. Jeff knows some folks. He's asking for money. Many of you know some folks. So there's going to be multiple angles asking Trey and Senator Tillis and Senator <coughs> Bishop, uh, Congressman Murphy, the, the others, to, to help us navigate through the federal system, whether it's Park Service money, whether it's ARP money, whether it's whatever pot of money's out there to generate what we need to start trying to find some solutions here. So that's just one potential source. There may be others, and that's what hopefully the congressman's office and the senator's office can help us navigate through the maze of the federal bureaucracy. So, yeah, and I clarify, absolutely... We didn't ask for money for beach nourishment. We asked for money for sustainable transportation solutions. Mm -hmm. there, uh, I don't want to speak for DOT, but there's a reason that they decided not to keep nourishing the beaches in Merlin. They decided that that was probably not the best long-term sustainable solution for them to protect the highway, hence the bridge that we have. There was a comment made earlier, which I did understand the concern about in the back, and that was the landing of the bridge and the roundabout is maybe a little closer to the ocean than folks thought originally. Yeah. So I, the there are certainly line. discussions and questions about what is the long-term sustainability of that landing on Hatteras <coughs> Island with the erosion rate we have, with the ocean overwash we have in terms of protecting transportation. And we've started that conversation with the Division One engineer um, in Edenton, but you know, I, I, think, I think there's still a little bit of, of happiness over the ribbon cutting for the bridge that was just opened. <laughs> so we don't want to get them too depressed over you know, restarting the project. But, these are all legitimate questions. Yeah, and I appreciate everyone looking into it. I just wanted to make sure that when we're talking about clarity and you setting expectations, I misunderstood when you said that you'd requested money at the beginning of the meeting. I guess I was overly optimistic, hoping that you were thinking about it for Rodanthe. And uh, if you ever need any pictures about the uh, flooding at the end of the bridge at the circle, I'm happy to share it when I can get out of my house uh, after a big <laughs> storm. Sometimes that can be seven days. Other questions? Bob, before we go further, just at the break, Mr. Farabee, in, in reference to those uh, funds that you mentioned, we do have with us this evening uh, Harrison Walker, who's a legislative assistant with Tom Tillis's office out of the Washington, D.C. office. I said I pointed to um, um, uh, Mr. Lewis earlier and asked him to look into it, but I had just during these breaks, uh, uh, further conversations, I had a one-on-one -on -one him, with him shortly, and he's going to look into that, and we'll readdress that and go see where we can get go with it and see if we can, see if we can uh, make some headway with it. Right. I had a question right here, I think. 
please tell us who you are and ask your question. Hi, my name is John Kuchta, uh, and I've been coming down, my wife and I and family have been coming down for about 12 years, so we're sort of new here. Uh, fell in love with the place, fell in love with the, the, the people, the atmosphere, you know, everything that's not Washington, D.C. <laughs> <Okay>? <laughs> <laughs> um, we do own a couple of homes down here now. We've invested a lot of money into those homes and maintenance of those homes. Uh, Irvin's around here somewhere. He, he's walked by one and he sees what we're doing to, to the house right now. It's right behind Redanti Pier. Uh, my question is this, and it's just from, from an understanding because, because I don't understand. There is a tourism tax, or there was a tourism tax, and, and you said that you've gone up and you've asked to increase that tax, and you've been repeatedly said no, or in your case, as your words, H no. You need to understand why you're getting that response. Sure. And, and because tourism, obviously, tour, you know, people come here for a reason. They want to enjoy it. They also, I hate to say it, abuse it. Um, we've all seen what tourism can do here. They should be paying for part of, of, of what's going on. So why is it that those taxes can't be increased? Or is that tax on us that you're talking about? That's the part I don't understand. So, so the occupancy tax is a creature of the legislature. The legislature gives us the authority to uh, impose an occupancy tax on the visitors that rent dwellings and rent hotel rooms and occupy rental space in their county. And they've given that authority to all 100 counties. And they have put a cap on that to all 100 counties of 6%, 6 cents. So any county that goes, if we go and ask for a penny for occupancy tax, Mecklenburg goes and asks for a penny for schools, Wake asks for a penny for a greenway, Forsyth wants transportation, and on and on and on and on. And all of a sudden you've got now a seven cent statewide occupancy tax, which the tourism industry, the tourism lobby, is adamantly opposed to. And they give a lot of money, they have a lot of influence in the legislature, and the legislature isn't going to do that. We were told we came up here to cut taxes, not to create taxes. And so asking us for a one-off, just one a local bill that lets Dare County do something that everybody else can do, can't do, is problematic. Um, it became an issue some years ago when someone looked at what we generate in oxy taxes and what we generate in land transfer taxes and what we generate in sales taxes, and we do very well. We're, we're one of the top four tourist destinations in the state. The top three are metropolitan areas like Mecklenburg, Charlotte, Wake County, but of the non-metropolitan areas, we're the tops and we do well there. Um, and so we do that because we have 300,000 people here in a community that only has 37,000 residents. And so we need those tourists to pay taxes to pay for all the things, the resources we have to have to service 300,000 people and to maintain our beaches and to do the things we do to keep those 300,000 people coming. Um, they aren't willing to go beyond that. Um, and we, again, have asked. Um, our concern is, as we expose ourselves to their scrutiny of how well we're doing, then do they start clawing back some of our revenue to give it to some place that's not doing as well as we are? And we can't take those risks because all those funds we've got are allocated somewhere. And should we cut any of those funds, we got to find another place to replace them or you know, pick up trash less or have fewer ambulances or whatever else, and then we can't service those 300,000 people. So there's a lot of reasons there that we can't do that, uh, even when we have tried, and so we have stopped trying. Okay. Any other questions before we go? All right. Um, I don't see any. As I said before, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. from Rodanthe. I want to thank you. First of all, it was an excellent presentation, very informative. I just had one question for our Superintendent Halleck. You mentioned something about sustainable transportation solutions. 
Does that involve getting rid of the stupid traffic circle that everybody hates? <laughs> and what does that phrase really mean? It does not include that. That's a DOT project, not a National Park everybody Service project. Everybody on the island hates that. That's well, that's... Well, we I mean, need, it's just the, we well, can stop. Those of us north of the bridge can stop then, just like we used to. Then you need to let DOT know. Okay. But you guys will let the other. You guys. Okay. Us. There you go. So what does that mean, sustainable transportation solutions? Yeah, uh, thank you for answering the first part of the question. <laughs> uh, generally speaking, it's things like, like bridges uh, that go around the hot spot. You know, you notice that New Inlet there, that after that Lego bridge was replaced with this other bridge, things seem to be sort of self healing on the island. That's because sandbags and dune building and all these other things we've done are well known to create more problems on barrier islands. Barrier islands renew themselves by washing over, by building island height during these storms and these washover events. And we're not allowing that to happen by building high dunes and by doing a lot of the, the engineering that we've done. So um, a lot of the advice we've received from coastal scientists have suggested the degree to which you can stop fighting Mother Nature and work with Mother Nature, you'll probably have something. And when you invest in that solution, it will last longer, and perhaps some of the other problems, the unintended consequences, will go away. Thank you. Sure. Peter's a need that might All right. Other, <laughs> any other questions? All right. With that said, if you go home and you think of something that you meant to ask and you didn't, please check on our webpage, send it in. As we get answers to questions that come in, we'll post them. As we learn more than we know tonight, we'll post that as well and we'll try to keep you all informed going forward. And with that, I'll turn it over to the chairman to conclude. Thank you, County Manager. Uh, as we close this evening, once again, I want to thank the uh, Roanoke uh, Civic Center folks for allowing us to uh, be here this evening and provide uh, some refreshments for us. What I want to say to you folks, we wouldn't be here tonight if this Board of Commissioners didn't care about what's going on on Hatteras Island. We're very, very concerned about the future. Uh, out of this subcommittee from the NC-12 task force, it's nothing but continuation of more bridges and bridges. And we don't know if that's the answer or not, but I can tell you right now, nobody works any harder and these gentlemen that are sitting up here in front of you this evening on a daily basis to make sure that we can try to do what's right and what's in the best interest of our citizens of Dare County. I could go on with a litany of accomplishments that this board has made, but I won't do that because uh, I'm sure you're probably aware of just about all of them. What I will say to you is we care. We will do everything in our best interest to try to move forward and try to find solutions. Work with us so that we can hopefully uh, make some headway and some successes and, and try to help you folks out. Once again, thank you all for being here.